thank you so much for being on the show, Lisa. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I was spent some uh, time in Germany, you know, learning languages, um, and I have found it very interesting that you have a middle name called Feigenbaum, which means fig tree. <laughs> Um, is it like a family name or, or someone thought that it's interesting? Yeah, that was my, uh, you know, that my family name. And that's right. It, that's their origin. It's German. Um, it means fig tree. Most people don't know that. Um, so I usually have, used to have to explain the spelling and the, um, the lineage, but most folks are, have heard of like the Christmas song that talks about Tenenbaum. So you hear the, the Christmas tree with Baum is the tree and Feigen is fig. Um, and yes, yeah, so in the U.S., um, uh, many I used to have to spell it out often, but I did speak it um, a new a few conferences in Germany, and it was really nice there. I would just check into the hotel, and they knew that name immediately. So, did you come from a German lineage, or you were born in the U.S., right? Yes, I was born in U.S. Um, Again, did you pick yeah, up any ancestors. German <laughs> um, along the way? Um, no, you know, in in Southern California, where I was from, you, I learned a lot of Spanish, um, and um, I spent a summer in Brazil. I got to learn some Portuguese there, um, Hebrew and English. So, but no, not much German. Okay, not yet. <laughs> um, Lisa, you have such an illustrious career uh, at Microsoft. Um, so many things to talk about, um, AI, machine learning, emerging trends. You've been there, you've done that. You've seen everything there is to see. And I am super excited to actually have you, but let's start with um, one of the, very common themes um, that I see emerging in AI. There are absolutely hungry and talented people reaching out to me, trying to find out how to get into data science. Because unlike, unlike other fields, there isn't a really structured path to data science. You can do three months of data science summer course. You can start learning Python, R, um, you get some internships and all the way up to Google, um, you know, you can make it. So when I think about the software career path, that is something that you have to have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, and then you get a job, you have some experience. Data science doesn't actually have these kinds of requirements, which is kind of a confusing phenomenon for a lot of people because people are used to have a structure, a career or path requirements. Um, how did your path start? I mean, you went to Harvard, right? Uh, um, high school, and then you know you came into the software engineering background first, and then switched to data science. So I think you're the perfect person to answer that question. Uh, yeah, a lot of great points that you raised, and I have noticed that um, uh, that contrast as well. I mean, of course, within software engineering, there can be a variety of paths, but um, overall, there is uh, more consistently a path from a computer science degree um, into software engineering, and I find that in data science. Um, the distribution of backgrounds is a lot more varied. Um, and that's actually one of the things that I really enjoy about it. I think it's a it's an interdisciplinary field. Even if you look at like the, you know, where all of these ideas and innovation came from, they came from all these different fields and science, whether it's um, you know, statistics or um physics or um, math and um additional areas. So I, I think um, that's one thing that I found is just kind of been a theme throughout my learning also is that interdisciplinary study. Um, so as far as my background overall, um, you know, I'd always been really passionate and curious about math and science, um, even back in high school, um, you know, some of my favorite subjects were calculus, physics, chemistry. And so I think there's a common thread with data science where we're, you know, all of those fields are just trying to make some reason and modeling around this now through numbers and equations. Um, and I always love the way that we could kind of make sense out of it that way and then further reason and innovate once we had those models to work with. And I think uh, similarly in data science, right, we're, we're finding ways to represent um, the product or the programs in, in data and in constructs, and then we can apply these algorithms on top of it. And so it's, um, there's kind of those two parts of the, um, you know, of the challenge there. And yeah, as far as my path in general, as I mentioned, you know, that experience from high school, that, I think those kind of passions continued in college as well. Um, when I was choosing my major, which was applied math, I basically went through the whole course syllabus and looked at which courses just really stood out and I was excited by, and that was the major that, that matched all those. And again, it's like that application of math towards these engineering and applied sciences. 
And I think it was a you know unique experience at Harvard. They gave a lot of free range in terms of being able to take courses from Harvard, from MIT, from the Harvard Business School. And so you talked about the interdisciplinary study. It was taking um, electrical engineering at MIT and then in the business school, talking about organizational development and all of those concepts that come through in my uh, work today. And then at Harvard, both the, the math and the science, um, but then they also had this core curriculum with courses in psychology <laughs> and you have uh, your background as well. And I found that even though those were some of the courses that I didn't originally have on my list, I actually still think about themes that I learned through those as well. And so um, like to their credit, I think it was good that they focused on that, um, that having that diverse background for us to be able to draw from and um, bring these different fields together. So when I then when I was first considering, you know, where to start my career after I then completed my master's in applied math, um, I was really excited by an opportunity that came up at Microsoft. Um, I was a program manager for the Visual Studio IDE, and I think um, it, it just brought together a number of my interests. Like it was a way to, I, I was very curious about how all of these um, concepts then translate into the business world. I was curious how businesses make decisions. Um, and I was excited to work on a product that, you know, would touch millions of users and the changes that I would make on the, um, the IDE would immediately be seen and have an impact. Um, and I love the impact of the product also It's just the world is, world runs on software and developers are using Visual Studio to, and, and C Sharp and Visual Basic to, to build these, um, to build these apps and programs. So um, the impact was exciting as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that was a great experience um, to, um, to learn about how software is built in the tech world. Um, the developer division that I was in at Microsoft was a really established organization. I learned so much from so many people there, a lot of great practices. Um, and of course, we were building tools to help with those engineering processes with um, Scrum and building great products and high quality products. Um, and so it was a great way to kind of learn about um, those techniques too. And yeah, and you realized, you know, as I, I thought it was always fun to do interviews in that um, space too, because, you know, you often think about programming languages as being fixed. It's like, what can I build with this programming language? But then you'd have to remind candidates actually in this role, like you can change the language and you can evolve it. And so it's kind of fun to have that dial as well. Um, and a lot of different product lessons that come from that too, because I used to say like, if, you know, if we ever actually gave users all the hundreds and thousands probably of language requests that we get, um, you wouldn't ever want to use that language. It would be so complicated and things would be like confusing and contradicting. And so just that concept of simplicity and, you know, building into the core and having good product hygiene came through um, just a number of different lessons from that experience. And so, as I mentioned, I really enjoyed like the customer engagement too. So I spent a lot of time, you know, speaking about the different new features and helping blogging about um, the capabilities, tips and tricks for how to use Visual Studio and, and be successful at that. Um, and we were, you know, a lot of that task was around how do we help developers navigate emerging trends in the industry, whether that was asynchronous um, and distributed computing or better data access, always looking at ways that we could kind of simplify and raise the altitude level of abstraction um, while still having that power and granularity. And so as I was kind of engaging with the community and kind of getting feedback qualitatively, increasingly as big data was growing, we were also interested quantitatively in what that looked like. And so that was a bit of my purview then into the field of data science, um, you know, starting from just analyzing some of the, um, the business statistics for the, um, for our product, um, things like performance metrics and looking at the distribution of our users' experiences where they're, you know, you can't just look at the, the mean or even the median, like the long tail is actually kind of important too if one user, you know, if a small set of users has a really poor experience, that's obviously not acceptable either. Um, what else? Trying to quantify productivity. So if you think about, you know, new features that we're adding, how can we quantify success metrics so we know if that's actually helping you um, edit, compile, debug, faster, deploy your application. And so um, finding ways to quantify that. And then different applications for machine learning as well. Like we would, you know, typically you wanna understand what are those different engagement levels of your users and base that um, on data based on how users are actually engaging with the product and finding value from it. And so we did some clustering there to identify, you know, our 
our active use and all the things that go into defining who is a customer. You don't want um, to be modeling like lab machines that are just running processes on Visual Studio. And so being able to identify actual users. Um, and then that was a bit of my purview then into, into the Microsoft Cloud and Azure as the cloud was growing in the industry. Um, I then moved into the, the Azure team. I was applying a number of these techniques there. They had been a great partner for me in my prior role. Um, and so then went on to um, end up leading our customer growth analytics team as part of Microsoft Cloud Data Sciences, where um, we were focused on Azure as well as the intersection with other Microsoft Cloud services, such as um, Teams and Power BI. Um, and yeah, again, we started with the counting. So just having a consistent way to view all these businesses for um, our, uh, our leadership so that they could not just go into each business review with a different view of success and you know, could have that common consistent orientation so we could understand the intersection between these. Um, but then also would work with the program teams to understand how can we evolve our programs to help customers be more successful, whether that's through the onboarding and sign up process or with our marketing team, optimizing our paid media, um, working with the support team to organize their queue and backlog so we could be most responsive to users when they really needed that help quickly. Um, yeah, working with our documentation team also to evolve our, our documentation and make that um, effective and, um, and easy to find. So, um, and then finally our product team. So working with the different Azure service groups, um, backup networking and understanding user retention and how different feature improvements would evolve that as well. Um, so that's a bit of the path in data science. And then uh, my latest role is uh, leading our a data science group within Twitter. Um, and there, you know, to be honest, a lot of common themes, I think, from the data science techniques, but obviously different product, different set of users. And so there I focus on the, the onboarding experience to Twitter. So whether it's through sign up or through notifications or email, all the different ways that you come to Twitter and helping make that a seamless experience, looking at those funnels, understanding the, the drop offs and learning from that so we can best improve and streamline. Um, and then once you get into the app, what are all the different ways that you connect and engage to discover the content that is new and noteworthy um, for you and personalized to your experience? So, um, you know, all of your homepage experience, the models behind the, um, your timeline and feed um, and different parts of the, the UI that you engage and connect with as well. Wow, such a long list of accomplishments. Um, and just wanted to um, let you know that one of my first loves when I started programming um, was the language basic. Um, and you worked a lot with um, <laughs> Visual Basic and then um, on Visual Studio also, such a wonderful ID. Um, and I'm just wondering, what does it look like working um, in Microsoft, building a product um, or a service that has everything figured out when it comes to customers. For example, my company, uh, we are official partners with Microsoft in Pakistan. And we have worked with all the cloud providers, um, Google, Amazon, even IBM. We used to be partners with IBM also. And one of the smoothest, um, responsive, and easy experience was onboarding with Microsoft. And you certainly understand it from the scratch and you've built these systems from your own hands and you know you've seen that scale at a level which is you know global to say the minimal how does it how do you actually think how do how does a culture and microsoft look like where it's very important for everyone to think the bigger picture and not what your own team is doing i do understand that's a very hard project you know managing expectations and delivering but how do you actually do that yeah that's a great point um to be honest i think there were multiple techniques or approaches that we've tried and used over the years. And I think what you were pointing out at the end there with your comment was Conway's law, where you don't want to just ship your org chart, right? You really want to think about the end-to-end -end experience and not um, just have these different pieces. And as we would talk about it as like, you know, working together as a fleet and not just like individual ships. Um, I think the, the probably common theme that that guided us there was just always thinking from the customer first and that customer experience. and um, I have to give credit to um, the leadership, Scott Guthrie, he runs the cloud and AI organization. He, I think, um, you know, did an excellent job of really ingraining and prioritizing and um, rewarding as you do like through culture um, that the customer always comes first. And so thinking broadly about that customer experience, like any product decision, um, any ship room or triage, you just, you show the experience and that's really what trumps um, the decision about what's the right thing to do. 
And then there was, there were also a number of different things that we would do to try to get that exposure and understanding of different roles and different teams. So whether that's things like our support ride-alongs um, where we would go and we would actually sit with the customer support engineers and hear directly from the customers, um, you know, on the, the challenges that they were running into. And, you know, the expectation was for all functions to do that, whether that was PM engineering um, so that we could have the right instincts as we were building the products. Um, and yeah, it was program, the program management role has really evolved more towards product management there as well. So um, just being really being the voice of the customer and um, having that close understanding of both the the market and evolving needs as, and competition as well as the, um, the customer needs as well. There were also some scenarios where we'd even create end-to-end -end teams where their job was literally to like to think end-to-end -end across um, across these different groups and ensure that we were working together in a consistent and unified way. You have also talked about uh, the importance of um, networking, uh, building communication. Um, you talked about uh, creating great teams, uh, not only data science in general. And you have worked in great teams. You have worked before um, with Bill and then Satya. Um, and the leadership lessons that you have um, learned from them, um, that certainly shows in your work also. What would you recommend that new teams learn before they actually start working on a project that it sees through to the completion? Because that's a lot of um, projects that never make you know, the end of um, their life. Um, what would you recommend managers or leaders think when they're starting new projects? Great. Um, yeah, I mean, I think two, th two things I'll point out there. One is like getting the team together, building that trust and cohesion, because it's really like only once you start operating as a common base that you're going to be able to execute and deliver. Um, I think I've learned that both in the professional life as well as um, I played softball all my life as well, and just seeing the teams come together and like deliver, accomplish your goals. Um, and then having that clear view and visualization of what that goal is. So in the softball world, that was we used to visualize the game and like what that would look like when the plays would happen. And in the um, in the tech world, that's um, if you read, you know, Marty Kagan's work, he talks about, for example, writing the press release. And I always find that like really clarifying because there, you can always think about all the work and the activities that we do, but like, what is that accruing towards? And so the press release is, and he's evolved, I think, to talk about it as writing a customer love letter. Like what would a customer say that they just love about the results of what you built? Um, but it, it gives like a bold vision of here's where we're going. And so there are a number of like team building exercises that, uh, that do some variation of this but yeah as a leader you know you want to paint that vision and give a clear view of here's where we're headed and then you can take advantage of all the creativity and ideas and innovation in the team on how to get there because they'll have from their own different backgrounds experience and context ideas around how to achieve that as well um i think the objectives and key results framework if you read the measure what matters book that overviews that i think that's been helpful for that too because then that gives you a way to quantify what that end goal and result um, look like and then track that consistently along the way. Um, and then finally, all of the, um, the work, the discussion, like the lean series, um, lean startup from Eric Reese and beyond that, and like the min viable product, I think those are just finally good ways to check in as you go. I think Marty Kagan also mentions like de-risking along the way as you go to make sure that that vision that you have really meets the customer needs and the jobs that you ultimately want uh, to be hired for to do. Um, one of the common themes now that we're working um, online post-COVID word is decluttering. Um, a lot of Zoom meetings, Zoom has been blasted um, for um, so long now. You know, you have a phenomena now um, that APA probably approves of, um, which is Zoom fatigue. Um, and I'm just wondering, a lot of our productive time um, is consumed by Zoom meetings. And that certainly probably is an issue at Microsoft and now at Twitter also. Um, what should we do about it? And um, is there a way to be more productive and um, have less meetings? Yeah, I mean, I think whenever we do these kind of like team reflection and look backs, really in both companies that I've been at, like meetings are, are a topic, as you mentioned, like it's, it becomes, um, you know, they can really consume the whole calendar. Um, a couple things I like, I do think that there is a lot of value in having um, having space outside of just kind of 
running for, on, on the treadmill from one, one thing to next. I think a lot of our innovation and reflection comes from having that, um, that time to kind of decompress or just think broadly. Um, I like to swim and sometimes like ideas that I, I'll like make connections while I'm just, <laughs> you know, in that environment too. So I think um, having that good balance, I think is important. And so one thing that I've implemented in teams is focus week. So from time to time, actually just taking a break from those meetings. And at first it seems, um, it seems like, you know, oh, everything will break down. How will we continue to survive? We need these, but um, in the developer space, we used to have these, um, we like go dark weeks to for code complete for different milestones and phase. And I just, I, I kind of uh, felt like I got that confidence from that experience that, you know, we would shut off the meetings for a week and actually <laughs> everything went on. It was okay. You know, so when you take vacation, like things actually continue. So, um, so I had implemented that in my team at Microsoft and I was actually happy to see at Twitter, there's a company-wide practice around that as well. And so I think there is a appreciation for the fact that we actually do need focus time um, to, to innovate in between these meetings. And especially uh, another thing we would do is even on the regular week, having like some, some focus blocks, because I think we find that a lot of our work, right, it's not, right, if you just stitch together four different 30 minute blocks, it's not the same as having a two hour consecutive block regarding your productivity is you need to really get deep into these problems and think about a, a number different things as once and so we used to talk about that in visual studio we had a number of features to help like orient your windows to help you as quickly like get back into context and in the zone um and i think in um i think it applies to data science as well and i um i love to read i, I lead a book club as well and one of the books we had read was um the book drive by daniel pink and one of the exercises in there is around asking you when you're in your flow. And so that was a really fun discussion to go through with the team to talk about like, well, well when are we really in our flow? When are we our best, most productive? And we arrived at it is when we get that, the streaks of time to go deep. And um, the idea of hackathons came up as well. That's another time when we can take break from the consecutive meetings to really think about innovation and what we like to call white space is like, um, just kind of thinking out of the box and having open time to, to brainstorm and um, create. And so I think those definitely are important balances to the innovation because sometimes the, um, yeah, the consecutive things you're working on iteratively, um, you know, will, will help you advance and progress, but then these uh, more transformational ideas or connections can kind of leapfrog you forward as well. And what's your personal style? of um, working. Are you more of an introvert um, who likes to focus with no distraction or are you a um, you know, tireless um, extrovert with multitasking and you know, social media in between? Um, uh, certainly like a lot of um, what Cal Newport has to say about you know, um, plugging out and um, relaxing and um, you know, turning everything off when you're doing something because there's no such thing as multitasking. But how do you work? Yeah, to be honest, I, I can relate to both of the extrovert and introvert um, preferences and tendencies, um, and I have appreciation for both of the styles, um, so I can relate to some of those, but I, I do test consistently as extrovert um, on that spectrum, and, so, and I remember I was in a course where we were um, going through this training, and I asked because I, I feel this, I can relate to both, and they mentioned I had already asked I think two questions and I was raising my hand. They're like, I'm just gonna tell you, you're probably the extrovert. But I think the, the way that I relate to both is that um, I do like to have that deep thinking and quiet time. So when I'm writing um, a blog post or working on a project, um, you know, I, I like to have that quiet consecutive hour block to really go deep and do my research and bring that all together and um, think about it deeply, but then, I love to share it with others. I love to discuss it with others. I think that's one thing I've consistently found, whether that was when I was working on Visual Studio, I would, you know, I would speak at a lot of different tech conferences and it was so fun to take like all these things I had been just thinking so deeply around what the experience should look like and then to talk to the users and hear what they think. And, you know, and they had all this passionate feedback about something that I was spending so much of my time on. So I love to go and share it and then bring that back. And I find the same as my work has gone throughout the career. Um, blogging, it's always fun to kind of share and then hear what other data science leaders think about this topic, what approaches have they tried and bring that back. Um, but it's nice to be able to share that, um, you know, that more complete thought 
I think, you know, we've also had a lot of this trend in, in meetings at work to, to do these document led meetings is um, a consistent practice. I think Amazon was one of the first with that, but now it's become um, kind of the best practice across a number of tech companies. And I think that that helps with both of the styles because you can, you know, you write the doc and then also you share it in advance of the meeting. People can start commenting, reflecting, and then you have a more productive discussion bringing that together. Um, and Twitter is moving towards like an async first model where I think a lot more of those discussions are actually asynchronous through the commenting on these documents, which is a great way to respect different time zones, but we can still have that great interaction and, um, you know, really leveraging the diversity of ideas and backgrounds as folks come together to reflect on these deep topics. Um, interesting should, you should say that um, Greg Kukio was on my show, very good friend of mine, um, an AI influencer at um, Amazon, and he talked about that we would have meetings in Amazon where everyone would just simply sit down and read. And, you know, for me, coming from a different background, that was like really surprising. But what we found out is that it was really, really productive. And I was just wondering, how would you compare it with the Scandinavian experience where I've lived um, and studied for quite some time, where um, productivity is about 40% higher than US and they're now thinking about, they're already on five day um, week um, and now they're thinking about four. Um, and there's significant evidence that um, you cannot actually have a productive um, day where you can work, like really focus more than three or four hours out of the eight hours. So this is, you know, American pride of working three jobs um, that might not be actually very um, scientifically um, let's say tenable position. What's your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, I, I wonder if like we each have our own rhythms as well. Cause like for me personally, I, I, at least my first half of my week, I definitely, have, definitely have more than three or four hours, maybe two or three times with that. Because again, I get in the context and for me, I'm most efficient. I could just like then kind of go deep there with all these thoughts in, um, in mind. But I do like to keep a, a no meeting Friday and then have that break between them. So for me, um, yeah, I, I do go longer than that on specific days, but I can't do that for all of the days. So I, but I think that's like my own rhythm. And I feel like, you know, everyone figures out their own rhythms as well. Um, and that's one thing that's been nice about this, you know, as we all had the the remote work and now as all the companies are thinking through what this hybrid work is going to look like um i just really hope that we can use it as make it a benefit now for everyone to figure out what are the the models that work best for them um and then be able to support that um and if, if you take actually you know, just zoom in a little bit on um, this whole phenomena what's emerging now is called the great resignation um where people out of a sudden are finding opportunities becoming rampant for them. And, you know, a lot of tech workers living in and moving jobs, you know, they're asking for higher um, salaries. Um, and that certainly must be an issue uh, for um, GU as um, a head and um, was employing a lot of people uh, recruiting for uh, great talents. Data science as it is, um, the shortage in um, good supply of engineers and data scientists is, is already short. Um, the starting point is around 150K, uh, where the average household American um, income is 50 to 60,000 um, dollars. How do you see this phenomenon emerging, and why is that actually happening? Um, and is it a good thing? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think data science as a field has been growing. You'll you'll find it on a number of the hot job list for quite a few years. Um, and I think right now, overall, the job market is very active. Um, um, I mean, a number of ways to look at that. I think it, there's a number of themes that come up around just, you know, all the responsibility that we have to continue thinking about both the, the current employees and making any environment that we're in the best place to work. Um, there's a quote that I really like, the, the grass is greener where you water it. Um, and so I like to, when we think about like all the team investments that we're making, anytime you have like a team um, pulse or poll, like reflecting on the current experiences, really taking that seriously and having even more regular check-ins, retrospectives to see how things are going. How can we continue supporting um, current employees and roles to make sure that they have all the, that they're 
um, their, their current projects and responsibilities are aligned with the passions and interests um as well as where they ultimately want to go in their career path and then and then as far as um yeah new talent coming in i mean i think that there's um there's just so many opportunities out there and so yeah there's you know it's an interesting time um you know regarding just reflecting on the different opportunities and roles and you know what folks are looking for at this point in time um it was interesting because i you know i made a job change during this time that was not really planned to be part of this <laughs> grand movement um for me it was more around i was kind of two decades into my career and um at some point you know as i was reflecting on the experiences that i wanted to have just wanted to be able to have some broader experiences um, um beyond one company although i was you know super grateful for all the the opportunities and amazing learnings that I had um, at Microsoft along the way. And so, um, you know, I think it's a personal reflection regarding then, like, what are the experiences that you want to have in your career? Um, for me, there was, you know, a few specific technical areas, business areas, um, people leadership areas that were on my list. And then um, and then also a bit of a checklist regarding just like the, the values and the impact of the organization that I wanted to be in and a lot of conversations that they had with, with people to kind of understand what the, the culture and dynamic would be like there as well um, to kind of feel like I was, you know, part of a purpose that I, I wanted to be part of there. And then lastly, you mentioned the networking earlier on as well. Um, it's something that now we discussed the extrovert side and you know it's a fun thing for me for me i love to just talk with different data science leaders and find out you know we're all going through these same experiences they're so analogous um so i enjoy speaking on panels with different leaders just getting to know different folks and say like hey what, what you know what have you tried for this scenario and often there's a lot of similarities but then there's some differences too so that gives us things to to try and even just for the similarities it's kind of nice knowing there's other people going through that too so i i find it can be a really fun and um enriching experience um and so i think it's a great practice also for just knowing what opportunities are out there as well because people from your network will know what you're interested in what you're passionate in and can can recommend that um i've given some talks about networking and there's a book called um networking for people who hate networking by devorah zach that's kind of fun um but i think networking yeah it has a lot of common misconceptions it can feel kind of self-serving or icky and that it's just kind of like you know trying to help you on these um you know, material goals, but I, I find at least half the time when I'm networking, like I'm contributing to somebody else. And so I think if you can just think about it from a perspective of what can I contribute to the other person in this conversation, whether that's, you know, someone you're networking or even a mentor who you've um, requested time from, and then um, think about like, together what can we accomplish like what's the broader shared goal like often in a company if you're networking with other people in the company there's always um, better together stories for multiple groups at a company and then outside you know how are you helping advance the conversation and in, in the industry or community on a topic together so um those are a few things i like to keep in mind when, when engage in that yeah i saw your presentation on uh networking for people who hate networking and i found it very very useful um because a lot of my friends kind of um, fall in that bracket because they're coming from a theoretical physics background and these guys are you know all in their heads you know abstract thinkers uh, phds postdocs and they absolutely hate conversations which are small talks um and they would have i personally believe really benefited from networking if they actually liked it uh, but let's talk about um your work with a lot of other leaders that you're sharing um the stages now um in conferences and session talks and what makes twitter very different from um, everyone else, pretty much, um, is this, we have this one guy who's sending people um, out into space, and there's this other guy who wants uh, to put people in metaverse. And there we are with uh, Twitter. We, you want to communicate with each other in 160 words in text. Um, sounds like a very uh, boring way for a lot of people, um, but there's still millions of people on Twitter. First of all, why do we even have Twitter? I mean, why do people write in 160 words to each other? Um, what purpose that serves in a world where everyone wants to have an Oculus VR? Um, and secondly, how do you actually relate to other leaders who are coming from different industries and backgrounds, which relies a lot more on um, just the text? Sure. Um, 
yeah, as far as why do we have Twitter, um, you know, really the, the charter is around helping advance the public conversation. And so if you think about like any social movements that we've had, any progress that we've made, it's always through, you know, through conversation and bringing together these broad ideas. So the fact that, you know, it's a public forum and environment, so we get that diversity of ideas coming together. Um, and then the word count is around the speed. And so, you know, just the matter that you can so quickly um, consume this information and have that conversation um, is, is the focus and goal there. And so, of course, that comes into play in a number of cases with like natural disasters and emergency where Twitter is like just played an amazing role in terms of being able to, to create awareness and rapidly bring help um, and whatnot. Um, and then as far as like your second part of the question around um, just the communication and maybe text from different leaders and scientists, I mean, I think this is a common theme in data science as well, um, but it came up um, even in, I remember there was a course at Harvard called Engineers Must Speak. I think there's a book on that too. And I remember kind of thinking like, hey, we, you know, we spend all this time focused on the science and the innovation. Like, what is this speaking thing? Um, and then there was another one of those core courses I mentioned that was required. It was around rhetoric and like going through Aristotle and the different modes of persuasion. And if you think about our job in data science, um, it's all about influencing with data, right? Making the right changes happen with data. And how do you build trust with your stakeholders and cross-functional partners? How do you um, actually make an impact with all of the innovation and research that you've done. Like, well, of course it requires communicating that in an effective way that um, people will act on and, and create changes. And then that that's really what's gonna cause you to have a greater impact with this work. Because if it's just done in a silo, um, you're kind of limited in terms of the, the broad broader um, changes and repercussions that it can have. Um, it's, it's very interesting. I've had this conversation with a lot of people um, who come on my show. We have Josh Charmer who comes from a, uh, biomedical background, and then we have chemistry professor um, Shanine, who is from Thailand, and he makes wonderful videos. Such a uh, famous channel called Data Professor. A lot of people actually learn their first um, apps from him. Uh, and the mere fact that you know people are coming from all these backgrounds that apparently has nothing to do with computer sciences um, is fascinating. Uh, so you yourself come from, uh, let's say, the vanilla hard sciences, mathematics, physics, chemistry. Um, how is the transition like from a very theoretical abstract um, field into computer science and then building on the, building on that as a software engineer to data science? You must have felt some kind of uh, dizziness between uh, the whole paradigm that we are, uh, you know, we are inculcated when we're studying. So you, there's this one field, you have to progress in that, you have to build whatever there is, but then you have to switch to another a way of thinking about the same field. Um, how did you actually change it? Like your, um, your, your switch from the traditional software background into um, data science? Did you take any statistical course again or did you just simply brush on your Harvard courses? And how did the journey go for you? Yeah, um, I think probably a combination of factors. For one, I think um, applied math at Harvard actually meant that about half of your courses were in math and then half were in those applied sciences. So I guess throughout there was some aspect of um, that combination. So I did have multiple stats courses there as well, for example. Um, and then with the electrical engineering courses, we were basically taking like uh, we were using MATLAB at that time and like modeling um, this, taking the analog equations and putting them in digital format. So I think there were some aspects of like those interdisciplinary throughout, but I, I do agree with the aspect you mentioned around, um, you know, each transition there, like being, you know, being a little bit different from like that core traditional background for this role. Um, and that, that was a journey to go through. I think, um, one really interesting learning from that was like whenever I felt a little bit different, um, actually the answer for like how to address that was usually to actually use what was different about me and like what could that uniquely bring to the situation. Um, it was funny, I had a friend write about this as well when he joined a team recently as well and he felt like Team. And so he actually didn't share as much about that. And then about a month or two in, like his, his manager mentioned, like, hey, we actually <laughs> recruited you to this team to bring on that new <laughs> skill set. And that's what we do want you to, to bring. So I think there's one reminder around, um, you know, just 
leveraging that background in different ways. So for example, for me, moving from that developer division space into data science, like there were things around min viable products that actually apply to data science that weren't used there, but actually we could think about before we build this complicated, uh, you know, before we invest multiple months in building this model, what if we actually create that wireframe of what, what the outputs will look like in the end or create a simpler solution, maybe with um, lower performance to begin with, um, but just to understand if this is going to work in the business problem. And then we, you know, for one, they could actually even use that um, as a quick solution in parallel while we develop the longer solution. It was already advancing them from what they had today. And sometimes even the business needed like a little bit of an interim stage, like an analytic solution before we could get them fully ready to base their compensation or their like high stake customers recommendations on this black box, I'll say black box, but really like model explainability became a big thing there as well to make sure they could understand and trust the recommendation. So anyway, that was just an example where like that more of a engineering approach actually was helpful in data science. And then, yeah, of course, like you always want to then understand what are the other areas I need to learn. And so I think in each of these roles, having in parallel a learning plan, um, you know, looking at the um, the different, the Venn diagram of the different areas that are important skills in the new role. And so um, then leveraging that in parallel. And so I think that aligns with just this overall like strengths finder approach, um, a number of different like career planning approaches where like you leverage your strengths, you leverage your experience, any job you go into, you want to have like a balance of things you can leverage to immediately, you know, be successful, have quick wins there while in parallel, like learning new things, doing things that are a little scary or different that excite you that keep you challenged because actually we do our best work when we're um when we're challenged and needing to to push a little bit um to to learn new areas so yeah in parallel i would often have learning plans and um i think for learning i think that really depends on kind of your personal situation if you want to do more of a um a program certificate degree there's a lot more of those emerging in data science for example, or if you want to do that on the job learning, um, do more of the online course MOOCs that are kind of available and bite-sized courses. Um, so yeah, using some combination of those, like learning on the job, learning from others and learning through formal training um, and having a hit list of the things that I need to learn. Um, I remember that was actually a transition going from school where I always had these like very well curated um, lesson guides and plan to then um, in a professional world, I think you know, needing to kind of like learn as we as I go, because I would actually need to be in some of those environments to see what are the techniques or concepts I need to learn about. And then I could prioritize my learning and I could like internalize it a little bit more so that then what I studied, I could kind of apply back the next day on the job as well. Um, it seems like Microsoft, despite its uh, wonderful investment in uh, R&D, you know, they're, they're fantastic um, workshops um, on Microsoft uh, Research Channel on YouTube, um, and the papers coming out of the lab was, were really great. But, you know, it somehow looked like it, it has lost um, the battle uh, to Amazon um, in early cloud um, adoption. Um, in terms of um, Azure, um, the library that are coming out of that NLTK, uh, other libraries that are being developed in Microsoft, and then the OpenAI collaboration, it came way too late um, for some people, you know, who, who were expecting Microsoft as a leader in that area to, um, you know, they were expecting Microsoft to emerge a lot faster. As a business leader, where do you think um, things um, went wrong or were a little slow? Um, gosh, take me back through history a bit there, but... Um... I mean, I think as you pointed out that there is a bit of a kind of first mover advantage effect that then um, kind of accumulates over time where kind of when there's one provider that um, is broadly used, then you kind of go to workshops and you hear from others what they're using and without even doing your full research, you just kind of like take the referral or recommendation and it kind of cycles or builds. But as far as like the innovation and the, the service and the reliability, I mean, I think that Microsoft is right there with the capabilities and the, the offerings um, and the certifications that have come out um, regarding Azure and, you know, used in different industries. And so um, I think there's been, you know, great momentum with the cloud, but, you know, starting from a, a position of kind of like building the, the market share. 
So you're in terms that you know, Microsoft now again become um, one of the most valuable or probably the most valuable company now in the surpassing Apple um, recently. And that certainly um, credit goes to Satya and the new leadership. Um, we're doing a lot of work. Uh, but let's uh, talk a little bit about how do you actually develop the leadership? Um, and um, you have um, had this fortune that you know you have found the, the Azure Shark teams also for your softball. And sports for me personally have been uh, very, very useful in uh, learning a lot of lessons, you know, um, learning how to lose and how to get back on your feet, um, you know, managing teams, um, expectations, preparing for the best, giving out your best um, and planning out there. What did softball teach you? <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, I can I can comment on both of those, the leadership and then the um, things I learned from softball. I think, um, yeah, Satya had been an amazing leader to to watch. It's really incredible, like what he had done to the company. I think you can directly see how that has led to Microsoft's success currently and going forward. Um, so he has a really great recount of it in the Hit Refresh book as well. Um, and I think about a number of those lessons as well, building out my team teams too. So he talks about, um, you know, just how do you think about building culture for, you know, over a hundred thousand person organization? Like it's a pretty large change to make. And so, you know, I think the way he talks about kind of how we work through like each level of the organization and building that trust and also, you know, culture is a lived experience of course and so you know just thinking about like the actions he did that was a fun book for me to read because it was a bit kind of like a recount of like all those years that i had spent at the company kind of hearing his narrative about it as well but there were like poignant moments um where you know you think about like the first hire he had with peggy johnson and the the way that he described the qualities that he looked at in her like the fact that she was a great listener and how that really helped her in the partnerships that then she built and the trust and you know it's just not like the first word you would see on a list of like leader qualities um in the past but but it was an example of just the, what the culture he was creating and there was an all hands that he talks about there that i remember sitting in where someone asked like hey why doesn't this why doesn't one note have this feature and he kind of asked well well just make it like if you see a problem like be an agent of change and so it was just and then he had other ways like through our um performance connects, um, you know, you talked about the value of diversity and inclusion, but then I do actually like show that that's, um, you know, what we value. So through promotions that was called out um, and, and uh, you know, I, I think taken pretty seriously there around like the impact that we we're all having to help us advance and make progress. And that was, you know, on every, it went from, you know, for thinking about for, for that many employees, like it went to every single individual's um, check-ins around how they were helping advance that. And so, um, I think that was great to see how he advanced the culture there. And I think it's been so critical to Microsoft's recent success where it's really a, a unified story across all the different cloud services. And so that really required getting the teams to work together, like have an inclusive environment, um, be willing to have hard conversations. There was another book I read recently that um, the five dysfunctions of a team where they talk about, you know, having those open be, building trust so you can have open conversations and we're only going to be able to make progress as we we do that. Um, yeah, there's also one called thanks for the feedback where, you know, I think often in the moment it can feel nice to say something nice, but actually like it's actually not the nice thing to do if you're thinking something, but you don't actually share it with some. I mean, of course, in a, like a respectful way. And if you have that trust, then they know it's in the best interest. But we need to be able to have this challenging conversation. So that's how we make progress. So, um, yeah. So, again, I think that's how all these teams have then been able to come together. And I think, um, you know, lastly, Microsoft has really transformed through the um, evolving needs of the pandemic and being able to identify what stay close in touch with customers. Like I talked about that customer first attitude and theme that we had through all of our reviews. So understanding the needs and how we can quickly prioritize and evolve our products. Prioritization was a big thing too. Like if you're gonna ask teams to do a bunch of new things, we have to be clear on what not to do to make space for that. And so, um, you know, making a decision moving forward there was key. So yeah, that was so many great leadership lessons shared there. Um, as far as softball itself, um, yeah, I felt like that was a great experience to have growing up. Um, you know, for one, being a team sport, there was just that energy that you get through accomplishing something together as a team. And if I think through, you know, both 
those teams or we had the national or national competitions and all also translated just understanding like you know the the um you know practice makes perfect kind of approach um the form under pressure so um you know being up to bat and you know being able to be calm and recollected and do your best work in that environment i think translates to kind of like the workplace high stakes environments as well being able to keep your cool throughout um the resilience you know there's so many things that come our way um in the workplace and being able to stay calm and kind of navigate through those and having the confidence in yourself and the team and others and the support we can give each other to work through them um so yeah i feel like there's a lot of like similar um both skills traits um and then yeah when i look back on those awesome experiences that um i had with my softball teammates and the accomplishments we had that we still talk about today um or like the teams that i worked in where it was like we worked through that live site or we worked through that hackathon and you know just really came together and um had these great accomplishments as a group um there i, I do feel like there's a lot of kind of similar uh, feelings and experiences there it's such inspirational uh, reading a lot of your work, you know, where you don't only talk about data science itself, but also building teams and communities um, and developing resources, helping on people who are getting started. You're also on the board um, of Wisconsin, helping people. Um, was it Wisconsin or Washington? Sorry, you know, Washington, Washington was, University of oh, Washington. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I was just yeah. Um, uh, missing it up. Um, and I'm just wondering, where do you go yourself for... Um, Inspiration. I mean, what kind of books do you read? I mean, one of the things that you talked about at the end, one of the things that I really like about Reed Hoffman is that when he has a conversation with someone, it's just it's just a treat to listen to, you know, the kind the way in which it gets the real um, you know, juice out of um people who he's talking to. He recently released his book, and I believe it's called Blitzscaling, um, and his workshops, um, and all the videos by Greyhound. I'm such a big fan of that. Um, and another person is called Naval Dravikant. I don't know if you've heard of that. He's been on Joe Rogan's show also. Um, such a fascinating um, guy to listen to. Who do you read to, you know, look for inspiration or, you know, you find really um, helpful in shipping your ideas? Yeah, those are a lot of great examples you shared. Um, I think we're so fortunate that we have all these resources available. Um, like the books, I think, are from the standpoint of, like, how amazing is that, that we can learn like that these great leaders have taken the time for one to write down their thoughts and you can you know it's, it's like mentorship at scale you can like you can just learn from what what they've um realized through all these years of experience and wisdom it's the uh, you know what i wish i knew back when um kind of tale and yeah you mentioned blitz scaling i really enjoyed that series as well they have the book and then he also did um like a set of those stanford classes or on youtube and you can just hear from different leaders about their experiences as well. Um, yeah, so I think the combination of like the, the books and talks, um, those are a few that I really enjoy. I, I do feel like my learning has evolved a little bit over time. I think, again, there's kind of like both the technical areas as well as the leadership areas. But yeah, I think for the leadership um, that I, you know, I had done more of the formal trainings and workshops in the past, but more recently it has been, yeah, reading books from different leaders or watching these kind of talks um, and uh, reflections, interviews. Um, you mentioned Reed, that was, um, he's done a number of great ones as well. I need to check out the other person you mentioned too. Um, and then mentors, um, you know, just being able to then, you know, you know, those leaders, I think, share a lot of broad themes around how to you know, many topics, how to successfully go through an acquisition, how to set the vision, mission, strategy, objectives for your team, how to live the culture, um, how to, um, you know, th think, go, think about your values and, um, and kind of drive that through the group, um, how to do prioritization effectively, etc. cetera. Um, and then mentors, I think you can then kind of, so with those, you can kind of reflect on your own and like, how do I bring that back into my work? And then with mentors, you can have a little bit more of a dialogue and coaching about um, your specific scenarios. And so uh, those have been great as well. And, you know, I think a good coach can always like help pull out, um, you know, the ideas that you might have that you're working through also. So um, I've enjoyed that too. I've had a fascinating conversation with a very good friend of mine um, at Gramner, um, who writes for Forbes also. And he often talks about aligning the organization goals with you know, what you have at the moment. And 
one of the things um, that I believe we both share and are passionate about um, is the fact that how, why is that that organizations are not able to make the best out of their data? And that's been an industry-wide problem. I talked to a lot of um, leaders um, throughout um, different industries where we talk about they have the data, they're sitting on them, they don't know what to do with this and how to operationalize that, how to create business value out of that. What do you think are some of the reasons why organizations are not able to make the most out of their data? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there's a few different levels of this challenge, really. Um, for one, yeah, it's a great benefit that in many cases we have the data. Um, sometimes there are gaps regarding you know, instrumentation or scribing that still needs to be done to actually model a specific scenario. But usually, you know, at, at this point, like just with, with the amount of data that we've been able to collect and store, usually that's kind of iterative on top of that. I think, like you mentioned, a lot of times we actually have quite a bit too. Um, then it's the, the mastering, the modeling the data, the governance around the data, the creating the data dictionaries. Like sometimes that's not the most like glamorous work, but it's like extremely impactful. So um yeah focusing on like the the data engineering the feature engineering and the governance around it can be just extremely impactful like there have been models that we have improved and performance significantly just by going back to the data set and cleaning it um expanding it um increasing the completeness of it and you know that all the science that we do on top of the data sets only is good as the data that we're starting with it's the garbage in garbage out problem so yeah so having good discipline and focus and rigor around those foundations and fundamentals i think are um are really important um and then maybe with the data dictionary i'll just add like having that um that business domain understanding i think that's like one of the three spheres i actually think about of like data science skill set between that the technical capabilities and then finally like the soft skills to then influence with the data so that business domain understanding sometimes we might have data but if we don't actually um, understand like the the product or the customers using it we might not um, fully be able to take advantage of the data that we have and so if you just kind of focus the data scientists just on um, pulling numbers, you can actually end up like misleading with the data as well. So we need to make sure that we're, we have a good understanding of what these fields represent and that we're using them appropriately. And then, yeah, so once we kind of move beyond then the, um, the data engineering, the, um, the governance to then, how do we take advantage of this in the data science problems? Um, a few different things I think we run into. I think a lot of the courses around data science are really focused on the techniques like okay is already defined and then you need to do, build the model on it um but often in you know in industry it's like the problem's pretty vague or ambiguous it's we want to achieve this goal we know the success metrics but how do we leverage the power of data science like you know do we even is it an analysis is it an experiment is it causal inference is it a machine learning problem and then um you know, what would be the model to help? So if I take support as an example, you know, we had a goal to achieve a certain level of support satisfaction. And of course, there's so much data around these tickets and the um, the exchange back and forth and like the, the time delays, like, you know, it, it's not defined like what that data science problem is. And that's a, a lot of what I encourage in the, um, in that board role that I mentioned um, is like putting, Putting data science is more in those ambiguous situations where you really have to think through like what is the tool belt that I have and you know use that creativity and curiosity um, to think through yeah I think curiosity is a big theme like what are the, the things that are emerging in the data where are those drop offs where are we losing users and like creating those connections that's what the business finds so powerful when we can bring those um, new insights together um, but I feel like that is it, it takes like a, a different type of role. It's definitely when you're in that stage where data science is no longer like a serving data set, da data point kind of function. You're kind of engaging more as a strategic partner and leader with your cross-functional partners to, um, you, you know what we're all trying to accomplish together. And then each function kind of uses the, the skills that we have to, to help us advance that problem. Um, and then last, and last kind of category of cases, I'd say that sometimes makes data science problems fail is kind of going back to the, the topic we mentioned around creating that press release and really understanding the end goal of what we're trying to accomplish and working with the users of that model to make sure that this really does 
match their system or flow. Um, so, you know, like one practice I like to do is even just wireframing, wireframing what the, the state or the problem is. So for example, we were working with our, um, um, our team of um, who manages the, the partners at Micros be successful. And so just starting from understanding, like, how do you work with the partners today and kind of diagramming that and understanding how this model's outputs are going to be, you know, what that's going to look like and how it will be used. So I think, you know, just like you do again in software development, you start back from like the problem you're trying to solve and then think through like what the solution will look like. That is a much more effective way than getting a general idea, maybe, you know, building out this big system and then you go back to the stakeholder and it's like, this is not <laughs> what I was looking for or what I needed. So I find that's where you kind of use them in viable product. You de-risk along the way, you ask questions, you see is this along the line, you get feedback, um, iterate and get on track. And I think that that definitely helps up set up for success that you're building the thing that your user is going to want. And you also have the buy-in from them that, that they're going to adopt it because they've actually been able to kind of be part of that process of defining it and building along the way. Um, it's very interesting you talked about, you know, the buy-in um, from the customers and aligning what you're um, looking for um, and then what customers are looking for. And one of the cutting edge areas of research that's emerging now um, is the data-centric uh, models and in comparison to machine learning centering models, uh, because with the computing power increasing, we're still kind of hitting the, you know, Murphy's law. It seems like it's um, it's not true anymore. Uh, so there's so much improvement you can have in models, like 0.5% or 0.8%, 1%. So if you look at the generation of these models, GPT-2, GPT-3, all these models, so there's not huge improvements in um, the next versions. On the other hand, um, I was in um, the um, HAI um, Stanford uh, workshop yesterday where we talked about the data-centric um, applications um, in uh, healthcare where they're, um, they were analyzing MRI um, scans and what can be done to increase um, the data that's available for MRIs to actually make good predictions instead of you know, focusing on the machine learning models uh, to find novel ways you know, to be able to work out of the box um, on the um, unseen sample. And I was just wondering, is that a concern um, also um, at Twitter and formerly um, at Microsoft where you know, things are you know, focused more on uh, data and not on the machine learning aspect of that? Um, Andrew NG talks about that, um, and you know he's, he's very passionate about you know having more conversations about data centric um, research than the ML centric um, research. And uh, what's your take on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I I still find that actually in investments in both are um, are useful. I guess it maybe it depends a little bit on where you draw the line from one to the other. But I think you know and investing in further signals um, for the models I think about, you know, just broadly, what are all the, um, the data points that we can leverage that may be good predictors here. Um, and then we talked about, yeah, the, the platform investments and how those can ultimately impact the model performance as well. So yeah, it's true that as you get further along on particular models, like the, the you know, the, the level of performance improvement that you get from um, tuning might kind of reach diminishing marginal returns. Um, but of course, there's still work to continue, like to continue retraining the model and ensuring that it's still meeting those needs along the way as like our, the problem space changes too, the product changes, the customer expectation changes, the industry evolves. Um, so um, still plenty of work to do in terms of um, continuing to, to check that model performance and kind of retrain, evaluate over time, consider how it's, um, it's modeling the current scenario. Um, but yeah, I, I can definitely appreciate all the points you mentioned around the, the data investments too. Um, we have just had um, NVIDIA GDC um, last week, um, wonderful presentations. Um, the keynote as always was uh, fascinating uh, by Johnson. And they also talked about um, the launch, I think 64 um, SDKs and libraries, um, which is a huge feat. And then they talked about a lot of solutions for different industries like Omniverse, uh, which would be kind of the uh, metaverse version for um, NVIDIA. And then also talk about about um, uh, EC2, which is um, a climate replicating um, environment um, that they have and a line of other um, GPUs. Um, talk about how this, the landscape of technology, software, AI is going to form in, in an era where we are already facing 
a chip shortage. Um, Taiwan TSMC, um, the largest um, stakeholder in this game, um, that's where the most of the uh, um, chips are coming from. And then Apple coming up with M1, um, and then other companies are putting more money um, into that research. So we don't actually depend on um, one source of um, those shapes. How does the whole landscape look like to you? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a uh, bit of a crystal ball question to see how it's all going to unfold. But I think, you know, just I think broadly as we're seeing the trend, we're going to need to continue, um, you know, thinking about broader solutions and like, continuing to evolve, I think, as the situation further unfolds. Interesting. And you uh, have also been, uh, and probably still are on the board, um, to Mr. Washington, like we talked about. Um, tell me what are some of the initiatives that um, you are spearheading there um, and the impacts um, that, is, um, that are visible um, through them? Um, yeah, of course. Um, some of the initiatives are, I mean, I, I mentioned like Twitter's goal around, um, you know, helping you find the, the new and noteworthy information that's um, personalized to you. So ensuring that we have a, um, a great experience there, um, helping onboard users effectively and make sure that it's, you know, easy to sign up, easy to, to quickly get started on Twitter and find, um, quickly see and feel that value. Um, as far as the metrics, I mean, many of those are shared like through our, our quarterly earnings um, reports, our MDAO, the monetizable um, daily active users. And then we basically have, you know, kind of a breakdown is it, through the typical OKR structure regarding how, um, you know, any given initiative like accrues up to those overall um, goals and objectives as well. Yeah. Um, I was talking about your position, a board position at the University of Washington. Um, and how do you actually help, um, you know, form their curriculum, um, their data science instruction, and what are the improvements um, that you think um, are necessary in our overall, overall education um, system of data science? Uh, uh, what, what are you doing at the moment um, at, on the board? Sure. Um, so, yeah, there's a few different interactions. I mean, I'll, um, sometimes I'll give talks there as well, just to have like a... Um, help the students get get exposure to what these roles look like in industry so they can kind of ask ask questions around um, you know what they're learning and how that translates um, into the the job um, I know that was a big question that I had as I was going through my master's program I was looking for like good career advisors there um, and while I did find a number of my professors were very just insightful and helpful and, you know, create great connections in the network there as well. Um, anyway, I felt like at least at that point, the career program, it didn't give like a clear path. And maybe it's because applied math was so broad. There was like applied math econ in different areas. But anyway, I was passionate around like helping create that connection. I think one thing I found really helpful at the time was internships to be able to then see myself in that environment. And it was, um, you know, quite a bit different than like the course itself. One thing that I'm really excited about that University of Washington has and that I've um, sponsors projects for other universities as well is these capstone projects where you get to actually, while you're in school, work with a, um, a, an enterprise on a specific project. Um, so I had done a program at UCLA um, around this that had an applied math program that kind of sponsored projects in industry and then um, through internships as I was actually debating if I was going to go continue in academia or go into industry. And I think I just decided, I found there was a lot of the same, I remember we were using like the same Navier-Stokes equation in two of those internships, but I like that, um, that experience of like shipping a product and seeing it come to life with users. So yeah, I, I find um, another way I work on the board there is, um, you know, reviewing curriculum, um, providing recommendations, feedback. Um, we have some calls with diff the different board members together and the, um, the professors and uh, program organizers to talk about um, curriculum and then beyond that, just like different programs that they're, they're doing, whether it's Capstone and, and others, um, talks that they're doing around diversity and initiatives. Um, so a broad set of topics, I think that, that they're, they're focused on advancing at the school. Um, so, but I did mention earlier, you know, just that idea of the application and helping data scientists think 
when you come to these ambiguous spaces, how can I best leverage all these tools that I built at the school here? And so that's something that they're, um, you know, they're working on through the capstone program and through the curriculum as it evolves as well. Um, it's also very rare. And I think um, they're also working on um, kind of industry mentors. So that's another way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's also very rare that, you know, a woman come in STEM and, you know, um, are as successful as you are um, straight out of um, high school into Harvard, bachelor's, master's, and then Microsoft. Um, and you also started a mom support group at Microsoft also, um, talking about all these things. You're very passionate about um, talking about different communities, you know, building resources for people who want to get into um, the, the STEM fields, um, a lot of talk about inclusion and diversity. Um, and despite all this, um, it's also a phenomenon that, you know, women are leaving STEM faster than they're joining. And I'm just wondering why are some of the reasons why they are um, leaving? Is it kind of temperamental or um, are there any um, systematic um, barriers for their entry or staying there or it's simply a personal life choices? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I would say it's a combination of those things. Um... And yeah, like you had mentioned, I am really passionate about having these communities. I found that was kind of a theme through, I'm um, kind of working through the developer ones and um, managers, data scientists, women in data science, uh, women in tech uh, and moms as well. I think that just like, that actually helps keep people in these fields as well, because um, a few things these communities provide. One, you realize that um, you're not alone. So one thing I like, there's, you know, one-on-one -on -one mentoring, but there's also, um, mentor rings that I would lead. And one nice thing about that is that in addition to kind of getting advice from a mentor yourself, you actually get to hear that you're not the only one asking this question. Other people have questions that are actually on your mind but you didn't think to, to raise. And then it creates just like this support group where, um, I don't know, I, I just really think that there is a measurable value that you get from just that energy. And sometimes it's really all that folks need is like a little boost to kind of take that step or, Get that confidence that they need to to move forward something that they already know they need to do they just need others to tell them it's okay and you can do it um and so yeah i think um that's one reason that i'm passionate about having the the women in tech groups and the moms groups as well just so that you know there are a number of different challenges that that um that women in tech face i think many you know minorities in general face and so a lot of common themes there but yeah and it and it varies and evolves, I think, at different points of the career. Like um, you talked about, you know, even in school, like you're one of the few um, in the courses. And yeah, I think just being able to, you know, there's there's this concept of like when you see more, you see more examples, but then you feel like that's a path and you kind of, um, you know, subconsciously or consciously kind of think through that. But, you know, other times there's moments where you know, women can walk in the room and say like, oh, I'm, you know, I, I remember at one of my internships, I was the one woman out of 30 men. And it just kind of, it probably looked a little funny when we got to lunch. I always wondered like, what does this bitch just think I'm doing here? Um, but yeah, I try to have some humor with it, which helps as well. Um, and then try not to kind of, there's, you can almost do a bit of a counting game, like, you know, looking at how many of this minority there are. I think those are actually counterproductive. I think there's a lot of good just, um, um, you know, mental, you know, making sure that you don't have this like inner critic voice, like thinking through positively, like about the value that this other perspective is bringing to the situation. And, um, but I think early on, you know, at, for any minority, I think being different coming into a room, um, you know, I think just being able to, to start by talking about the work, that's like the common ground that you're all there for and show how you can contribute with your, um, your insights, all of your experience that you have, and then the conversation, which I think quickly evolves from there. Um, other scenarios women face, like through family planning and time off, I try to also turn that a bit on its head as well, because I remember, um, you know, thinking through this concept of maternity leave, like, you know, I've been on this like direct career path. It's, you know, just like one step after another, and then it's like, oh, there's going to be this break. Um, but actually, um, I think with all of our conversation around the interdisciplinary learnings, like you actually are learning things during that time. It's a little different environment, but there's things around prioritization, delegation, you know, trust others, you know, to 
child care and whatnot. Um, so I think you do come back with like a different level of maturity and wisdom that, you know, you can apply as a manager caring for your team in different ways. So, um, you know, I try to think about how it can be, you know, not a, um, how it can all add together there. And of course, it's a great life experience as well. So that's, um, you know, definitely worth something in terms of all the why people are leaving. Obviously, the pandemic clearly has you know, raised even more challenges. And with caregiving, um, somebody needs to take those responsibilities. And, you know, that's kind of historically um, been more on the women's side. So that's, that's definitely been one of the factors um, pulling women out, whether that's just the, um, you know, the specific logistics of it, or even just the um, mental overhead. I think, you know, there's been just so many life challenges that we've all experienced in different ways the past couple of years. It's really hit everybody in different ways. And I think that combined with kind of maybe responsibilities and, um, and um, yeah, just all that that's needed cognitively at work as well, I think sometimes could be overwhelming the situation too. And so, yeah, and maybe bring it back to the communities. That's where I feel like the communities are helpful. <laughs> the focus weeks we talked about are helpful. Like it's good to have, have you know, be able to find a way to balance it. And um, that's one example maybe where I also like to actually use the sprint, like retrospective kind of reviews. You can think about that even in terms of a life, your personal life, like just thinking back periodically, I mean, you don't have to actually schedule a, a monthly business review with yourself, but just like generally thinking like what went well this period, what didn't go well, I think that can be kind of clarifying, like, did I make the right choices that I wanted for, you know, how I wanted to be there with my family? Was I, you know, making the investments that I wanted at work? Um, I think it's important to kind of step back and reflect periodically, and then you kind of can have that that confidence that you're you're finding that balance or or are there new systems I need to place put in place like is there something I need to solve systemically um whether that's you know personally to set up a new arrangement for your family in a certain way or like a different you know maybe something at work that you're going to um delegate and create an opportunity for somebody so um yeah I think a number of good things that can come out of that and does this change anything um the whole experience um being a mom um, did, does it make you look at things differently when you come back? Because I was reading a research paper, it was quite interesting that, you know, all the Nobel Prize winners, um, they have had, um, you know, their research before they got married was the one that actually got them Nobel and the pace that they were working on and producing papers were unprecedented. And after that, you know, no one actually uh, worked as hard or published as much. I was just wondering if that's a phenomenon. <laughs> That's funny. I haven't seen that stat, so that's interesting. But um, I, sure. I mean, I think just really any life experiences can, um, kind of to that degree, can help put some things in perspective. I think you talked about Reed's talks. Like one thing that comes up there is just a key aspect of leadership is knowing that there's a number of fires going on and which ones need to be put out, which ones you need to prioritize. And so I think. I think life experiences like do give a different lens on that, even though something like maybe in isolation might seem like a priority, you kind of step back and think about like, well, what what really is going to make a big difference if it if it is addressed or is not. And you, you talked about cognitive overload. Um, does it actually help you train better or you know make you more resilient? Or does it actually take a toll on your work at some point? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's there's a spectrum there. Like you said, that at some point, um, like personally, I like to have a lot of different things going on. Whether that's at work, I like to think about a broad set of areas or topics because I feel like it helps me. It helps give me more ideas. It's just like that interdisciplinary idea that like both looking at the current area I own as well as all you know working with my my partners and peers. Um, I, I get collaboration ideas, cross-pollination ideas on how to bring them together, um, doing different things like these talks or conversations, hearing Q&A from audience is always like sparks new ideas too that I can bring back to the work and kind of have a different way to reflect on topics. So I love the combination of bringing that together. I also like that in my personal life. I like having a lot of different things going on there too. That's just fun for me and like I mentioned, and even from like the personal 
professional, there's like connections that come up as well. Um, but of course there's a limit to like, um, there's a theory around, um, you only have so many spoons, spoon theory. Like if you run out of spoons, like you run out of cycles or energy, then like you're not able to show up at the next thing with that full set of energy. So yeah, if I ever feel like there's a day where, you know, I'm, I'm coming to a meeting, I'm just tired. I'm not like my full self. That's definitely a sign for me that I need to, and I think that's, um, I think that's healthy because I think a lot of these roles, to be honest, we're not, we're not, it's not expected to be like fully on, you know, X number of hours every week, every, you know, every day, every week. I think um, it's natural to kind of have the, take some, do some cycles. And I think that came up with, you know, when I was in uh, more of the software um, engineering development space where, you know, we would, we would have cycles, like there would be different ship periods and you'd have like the crunch periods and then you'd ship and have like a little bit of break and come back. And um, I find, yeah, even with the projects today with the different quarterly or monthly cycles, um, there's ebbs and flows too. And so, yeah, it, it, we talked about like, it's, it's nice to go deep and like get really into things, but then, yeah, if you're going, you know, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So if you're, if you're going from just one to the next, like at some point you'll burn out and you need to be able to, to have those balances so you can come back. And I think that's probably the only way to really <laughs> sustain long-term in any of these roles. That's the bit where we talk about being good parent. Um, well, let's talk about being a good child. Um, and maybe that's a conversation I probably wouldn't want to have with your parents, but you know, I would take it if my daughter were a, were a valedictorian at school. Um, but how, how are you raised? I mean, what kind of child were you? Were you like in an outgoing, um, you know, obedient, um, good grades, um, studious child, or did you have this rebellion in you? Um, how did your parents um you know how did it deal with you because you know it's it's in my personal um, work and you know what i've seen um it's very hard to manage intelligent children because they're very headstrong you know they really have convictions they believe they have questions um how did it look like growing up sure um i was a little bit more on the former regarding the um i don't think i was as much rebellious but i was uh, um yeah, I had a strong work ethic like early on. I was curious about a variety of topics early on. Like I did the, the school, um, sports, I did softball and tennis. Um, so my mom, my parents are actually both, they met playing tennis, so we're a big tennis family. Um, my dad would always go out and play the softball with me as well. Um, brought me to all these tournaments, <laughs> faraway places. And then, yeah, I was into the schoolwork. Um, I was really into art as well. And so, I like to have a, I like to do a variety of things. Um, they said, you know, whenever they would sign me up for different activities, like I was always interested or curious to, to explore. Um, and, but then I also like to do whatever I took on, I wanted to do it well. Um, and I think that kind of excellence, like stay with me too. It's like whenever we deliver a data science problem project, like I want to be, you know, I want it to be pretty solid. Um, so, yeah, and that's where like the work ethic came in too, whether that was like studying or practicing. Um, yeah, I also did music, I was doing piano and guitar. So um, yeah, there was a lot of different like interests. Um, I think, yeah, a few things that they taught me. Uh, I remember my dad used to always say, like when I got home and I was, you know, doing my work for the next day, say like, do the most important thing first. And I feel like that has stayed true. There's all these different, you know, productivity themes or guides. And, you know, you talk about the important versus the urgent. Um, and so anyway, if I had a test the next day or homeworks, like always study for the test first. <laughs> and it's always like tempting to do like those quick and easy things. But, you know, I find that even with my, my work, it's like, okay, what's, what's really the most important thing for the team right now? And like, let's make sure to carve out the time to do that. Um, and then he, I mean, he was a chemistry major, so always really curious around science and a lot of questions. Like he was always trying to remember all of the, the PV equals NRT equations and curious about my schoolwork. And so, you know, we got to have fun topics around that. So I'm sure that that, you know, was just part of the regular conversation. And then from my mom, um, she was very social. So a lot of like the interpersonal I probably got from her. Um, and she also, you know, she, she had that like 
get it done attitude that I think I took from her too. Like she would have a lot of different things going on and she always, you know, would make it happen with her. That was like, you know, um, organizing big events with my siblings or somehow finding ways to get us all to where we needed to be. Um, I have a lot of things going on and then just finding a way to, to make it work and having that confidence you can do it. Um, interesting, my mother was actually um, the one with PhD in chemistry, my father's um, uh, a PhD in linguistic, and that wasn't fun, you know, trying to remember all the elements in the tables <laughs> because there's no use for me, at least I thought so. Uh, but one of the problems with um, academic parents are, um, or let's say parents who value discipline and hard work is that, you know, they're very, very tough um, in many ways. And you have to be perfect at everything with good grades, good music and the social skills. Did you sometimes felt pressure that, you know, I'm being expected way too much, you know? Um, and, you know, sometimes that, um, that gives rise to sibling rivalry for nothing. <laughs> I mean, how was your relationship with your siblings um, and how did you deal with that pressure? Yeah, um, so I didn't have any of that pressure from my parents on the achievement. Like they mentioned that, you know, I always did my homework. So they never felt the need to ask me to do it. I guess just, I don't know. I didn't even think that there was another possibility. It was like, that was a, what I was supposed to do. So I just did it. Um, as far as the siblings, yeah, I think, um, I think one, one theme there was just, you know, finding a way to give us each our own individual individuality. So, um, because, you know, they, I was the oldest, so they would get known as, you know, Lisa's younger sister. So I feel like, um, one thing there was that we, we played different sports so that it wasn't like, you know, we we're all just modeling after the same Path. So I was in a softball, my other sister was in a so soccer. Um, so yeah, having, I think, you know, and then just having that one on one time, I think, with each kid, it's important there as well. Oh, I know that um, elder and child burden, you know, <laughs> it's like you're supposed to be a role model for your younger siblings. I said, why me? Um, but uh, what is the best advice you've um, ever gotten? Because uh, um, I believe. At some point in life, all of us are looking for that one piece of puzzle um, that kind of makes sense um, um, and was really badly needed. Um, who did that come from and uh, what was that? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, I actually like to pull pieces of advice from different people as well. Like when I model my own leadership style, I'm always looking for elements that I like of, of different versions um, and learning from that or having actually a variety of mentors in that way. And a lot of things that come up in that conversation are more, um, you know, examples of techniques or tips that they've tried um, and, or, or just kind of support for things that I'm already considering and just kind of like something to give me the push that I need to, for that next move. Um, but I think one that I found interesting that was just a different perspective. Um, so Satya has this theme that he would share around thinking about not what you can do for the company, but what the company can do for you, which sounded wrong at first, right? It's like, we're there. It was a rip off from the, what you can do for a country. <laughs> Seems like a pretty close, close wording there. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I thought it's always, if you think about what you're trying to contribute, but I really like that twist because if you think around, if you think about for any you know, person on your team also trying to align their passions and interests to the team's work. And you talked about tying that to the overall company objectives. Like, um, I, I just love that perspective. So then thinking about, okay, at Microsoft, what are the key assets? What are the key initiatives? And what are the ones that I'm most passionate about? How can I contribute in a way? It's like more than not, you find that actually like things you want to do are are really exactly what the overall group is trying to do. And then how fulfilling is that to work on things that you're just already um, innately passionate about. And so, yeah, I, I felt like that was a really useful perspective there. And I think about that in my, my new role as well, like how I can be a force multiplier by thinking about like the, the assets and focus of the company and where that aligns to things that I'm already passionate and curious about. Um, I believe you have had a meeting with Jack this morning, um, and uh, now that you know, you're working with a long list of um, world-class leaders, uh, you probably might have 
um, nudge you to think about um, your own legacy also, what you've built throughout the life. Now you're going out there helping out people, um, building their own story, possibly inspire them and you know learn um, from your lessons. Um, we were in, live in a very different world from um, our children. Um, you know, they have no idea of what we have gone through. Um, you know, slow dial-up connections. Um, you know, poor internet speeds. You know, <laughs> terrible Windows, Linux. Uh, they have no idea what's going on. Uh, they're on cable, uh, and in 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 that ambiance, um, what is the future going to look like for them? Um, and do you think about your own legacy that you're leaving behind? Um, that hopefully inspires um, these new children who have no idea what we've gone through. Um, and you, you talked about Jack also that, you know, he thinks about um, the larger word, the contributions, um, the story that he's building. Um, how would people, um, or how would you like people to remember you? And would, would, what, what do you think in, in your own words is your legacy? Yeah, for, you know, for me at the end of the day, it's around the impact that I have on others, whether that's, um, you know, includes like personally with my family, friends, my community um, at work, through our, our customers, our partners, um, the users of the products that, that we're developing, like, yeah, that, you know, the, at the, the tombstone, it's like, that's my goal at the end of the day. I think what matters is just like that, that impact that we've, we've left on others in that way. And so I think that's actually been a part of how I've identified with both of these leaders that I've um, work for now. I think Satya also thinks about the legacy that he's leaving on the world and, you know, would often talk about just the, um, you know, that at the end of the day, like, that's what we're going to reflect back on is what's most important. And, um, you know, he has a big passion around things like accessibility, for example, um, diversity and inclusion. And so, yeah, like not many companies would put, um, you know, Super Bowl, like invest in Super Bowl ads around just how we're making the world a more um, equitable and inclusive place. And um, it's, there's a slogan along the lines of like, when we all play, everybody wins. So yeah, I think, you know, thinks a lot around, you know, how we're, we're helping other employees and then our customers, partners, and um, using our products for good in that way. And I think Jack actually very much so, like both of them were very focused on the culture in the organization. Um, we talked about that with Satya's book and how it, like the first thing he will focus on was culture. I think Jack always, every um, company meeting, we start with culture and the people and how we wanna treat each other. And there's the um, love where you work slogan at, at Twitter that's really all about, you know, how we're showing up with each other, how we're supporting each other, being empathetic and understanding each other. Um, and then also the, you know, the mission for Twitter, the product as well in the world and like the, the legacy um, that will be left behind around like how how we can use Twitter, how we use Twitter for good and you know the all the great impact that it can have in the world in that day. So in, in that way. And so I think that's um, been incredibly important for me, just being able to work at places where I can connect with the values um, and just have them so innately like align with my own as well. Um Lisa, it's it's not every day where I get to talk to people who build the tools that I've, uh, you know, grown up using, um, VS Code, uh, Virtual, Visual Basic, um, data science teams, um, and now at Twitter, you're doing great work. We talked about um, some of the, um, the features that are coming up um, with the whole um, sign-up process, um, user research, user design. Um, it's been a blast talking to you. Um, thank you so much uh, for uh, being in the show. Um, any um, last words that you'd like to say to people who are listening to you around the world? Yeah, well, I'll just say, you know, thanks so much for having me. It's a great show. I really enjoyed getting to follow along the series as well. I think it's great that you're bringing all these um, voices out to the community. And yeah, I think a last thing I would just say is like a word of encouragement and best wishes to everybody on their journey. It's a personal, um, personal journey, but I encourage, you know, you all to, you know, think about those goals that you have, find the support network that you need. And, um, you know, I think often it can feel a bit overwhelming just regarding 
and all that we need to learn or all the different paths that are out there. And I think, um, you know, finding your own path, figuring out what stays true to you and having that um, confidence, I think their data science and AI and broader career journeys as well.